So we need to do the remote participation confirmation to report the board. You call us, we're called to order. Tony, you called us to order? Okay. okay. Just the top one, actually. So we need a motion from one of the board members. I move that we request to change today's meeting of the day when we're a permanent of the medical condition that prevents their her physical attendance. Martha, I think we're getting a little bit of feedback from your mic there. Okay, let me try something else. Okay, otherwise we might, I'll just mute you and unmute as you need to speak. Oh, you got a backup plan. Excellent. Is that better? I, that's perfect. I also got a request from, from staff that uh, everybody speak up a little bit today. Right. Um, so first item of business is to approve and review and approve the minutes of our November meeting. Are there any comments on this minutes? If not, may I hear a motion to approve? I have a motion to approve the minutes. Um, Last November 2017. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. <laughs> All right. Uh, announcements. EDDM, e -D -D -E -D -D Every Door Direct Mailer. Yeah, well, Nelson is doing the library, and so we, we got our, our mailing out uh, finally. We had already had a, 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 a opening uh, and we signed up like 27, 7 kids at, at, that, at that opening. Um, but the, the mailing to every, every uh, Home in, in, in Nelson was, was kind of delayed. Uh, but, um, that is, I actually got mine the other day. Do we have any public comments? Looks like we only have staff online. Uh, if staff would like to make a uh, comment, raise your hand now. Doesn't look like you have any public comment today, Chuck. So, we don't really have to see continuing education, but we will get to continue playing through the feedback in the new business. So, we're going to talk about that. And it is and it is as enlightening as continuing education. It doesn't have to go into that agenda. <clears throat> so, I think the first thing under committee reports is the Central Renovation Working Group report. Okay. Um, since we last met, which was only a couple weeks ago, um, the Central uh, Renovation Working Group met, um, and we just went over the different people we've talked to and just kind of our strategy uh, going forward. And so our big effort now is to um, continue working directly with board of supervisors and with um, uh, members of council and staff and to encourage them to work together. I know it's my understanding, and this is a big breakthrough, that uh, Ned Galway and Brian Houston they're meeting this morning. We're meeting on Wednesday morning. Yeah. We discussed one of with David, and it is our hope that those two will agree to communicate with their staff, who are very well versed on this project. But they need to hear from their bosses, basically, that they want this to go forward. Obviously, so that, that, that's really a big accomplishment that 
get accepted. Um, and the other thing is that um, Jane Kula spoke before the Board of Supervisors about the project and kind of and did a very good summary of where we are, why we want to do this. And then I will speak at the next city council meeting, which um, the, the one in June, the first one in June, because they're pretty wrapped up with their zoning issues. Um, and do this and basically get the same message. So I think that's where we are. I, I we've done a there's been a lot of progress in the last couple months. We just you know, we're not going to you know make a big huge loud push right now. We really want the board of supervisors we're so close <laughs> to deciding together that this is important to go. I'm, I'm, I feel good about it. A lot more progress that has been made in the <laughs> I just I just wanted to chip in a, a thanks to Ann and Jane Kulo, who spent a lot of time meeting yes. with individual supervisors, and uh, to deputized working group member Mike um, Alex, who also jumped in this one last week. Uh, the only other thing is that I will be speaking in front of the Charlotte World Planning Commission. So. You spoke with Ned. Yeah. I spoke with Ned, and I was also set in with um, the Latista Kirtley. Oh, right. And so that's it's just a process of education, as your you and Jane have been yeah. kind of highlighting and coordination. And I, I think the main thing I wanted to give forth to both of them is because Ned is sort of an old hand and has heard about this for a while, but I wanted to just convey that there's a concerted effort. To make the pieces line up at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I think that makes a difference that there's just a, a kind of this consolidated right. uh, effort to you know, get the timing. Um, yeah. Right. right. But we're not at the theoretical school. Right. Yeah. Trying to get there. Yeah. But he, so they were both, I think, very receptive. Mm -hmm. uh, in B's case, she was at the central <laughs> library and was able to kind of. I think she said North. She usually went to Northside. I said, "Hey, next time you go to Northside, repair your impressions of that very popular facility." And uh, you know, very good try. Yeah. I think that made an impression on her as well. Again, for any hard work, appreciate that. Next up is a policy committee report. <coughs> okay, today the policy committee met. And uh, continued our discussion of the safe child policy, uh, which I think will be, I think we'll have we've gotten sort of a bullet point summary, and I think we'll be able to move to having looking at actual text to finalize uh, at our next meeting, which will be two months from now. And then we did an introduction of uh, the library and community partnerships policy and kind of discuss what does that concept mean and talk about some definitions and clarify that for the public. So that's going to be probably at least two more meetings, I would say, uh, in, the, in the works. So no, nothing uh, that's imminent to, to cross your desk here at the at the board level, but those, those are the two uh, that we're working on in the pipeline right now. Great. So, under review business, we have the strategic plan and survey feedback. As David has mentioned to you, some of you have seen this before, but I think a lot of good information that was contained in this, this uh, slide deck. And I think it's important for all of us to, to, to realize what the community, how the community sees us and the um, kinds of things they're focused on. So, David. So uh, thank you, Tony, and, and apologies to the five-year plan committee members who've already seen this. But um, also uh, thanks to Peter for pointing out there was a sharing issue with the links that I gave uh, last week. So if you haven't had a chance yet, you should be able to get in and see the raw data responses from the survey. And then um, because that's kind of hard to read, it's in a spreadsheet. Uh, the Tasha Richards here at Northside took all the free-form feedback and put it out into 90-plus pages to read um, at your leisure. <laughs> so it's good. We have an engaged populace that's interested in library services. Uh, had over 1,200 responses. Here, uh, the work 
largely on this portion of the this presentation and just gathering information to share with the strategic planning committee was a subcommittee um, made up of um, myself, Krista Farrell, Kayla Payne, uh, Pearl Hartwell, the president of the Friends of the Library, and Latasha Richards. So thank them for their work here. Okay, we'll start by looking at the demographics of who responded to the uh, survey that was open in September and October. Some of the graphics here are going to be a little bit small, so just holler at me and I'll, I can, I don't know that I'll be able to enlarge them, but I can read them, I think. Uh, so you can see that the majority of the respondents here were over the age of 36. So those two kind of grown up categories, 36 to 59 was 41% of the respondents. And then the largest responding category was age 60 and over. So um, more than half of the total responses, very close, but about half of the total responses came from individuals that were uh, 60 or older. The question as to um, what jurisdiction you live in came up. Uh, largely, it was Albemarle County, 55%, then City of Charlottesville, then Green, Louisa, and Nelson, so kind of mirroring our circulation throughout the area. Uh, for the 28 folks that do not live in JMRL jurisdictions, most of them came from Fluvanna County with a few Buckingham, Madison, Goochland, Orange County, Waynesboro, and somebody from North Carolina. <laughs> Okay, library usage. Um, so which JMRL library locations do you visit on a regular basis? And people could select more than one here. So there are more than 1,200 total responses because people do use more than one branch here. Uh, Northside was the um, visited by the most folks here, followed by Central, and then Gordon Avenue, Crozet, um, and then Green, Louisa, and Nelson. So again, that mirrors our circulation statistics. That's the, the percentages that our items check out there. Uh, the subcommittee was slightly disappointed here on um, how often do you use library locations or resources. It's a good answer for JMRL. These people are engaged. They're using the library on a weekly basis, uh, then monthly, and then a big 10% of them daily come in to use the library. But the uh, subcommittee and the overall strategic planning committee had made an effort to try to engage with non-users to try to get some response there. And uh, there were not a lot of never responses. So there were 1,222 responses to um, how often you use the library. And only 10 people left a response for, I don't, and here's why, basically. Um, <clears throat> But here are those 10 responses, so a very, very small uh, but mighty group of folks that took the time to let us know about their thoughts about library services. So they don't have transportation, not sure about locations, hours don't work, they use another public library system or another library system. I don't know what the library has, it's hard to find what I'm looking for, or um, I use an electronic library, I would like to get a card online, we're going we're gonna to use it extensively in the future. So a little bit of feedback there. What would bring you to the library? Again, small little subsection here, but uh, book clubs, other adult activities, coffee shop inside the library to read, have more of a gathering space, easy parking, multiple available copies of books I want, so no waiting list. Both of those are things that will come up from the users of the library as well. Uh, visiting author talks, um, I'd rather just use online services and kind of professional development. Okay, so let's talk about library services. This is going to be hard to read here. <laughs> Bear with me. Uh, how important are the following to you? So on the far right of each question, it's extremely important. On the far left is not important. Uh, the purple in this case. So it's borrowing physical books, borrowing digital materials, assistance from the staff, availability of newspapers and magazines, notary services, free events for children, free events for young adults, free events for adults. So far and away, the respondents told us that the most important thing to them was checking out physical materials. Um, the, um, the next most important things there were digital materials and free events for children. We got a few also responses that said, I don't myself have children, so that's not that important to me, although I appreciate the importance of offering programming for children. So some of the demographic information says that the respondents here were not of the age that they would have younger children and access to the services. <laughs> um, digital services was pretty split more than any of the other ones across the board there. So people say it's not important at all to me to it's kind of important to it's very important. It's all about, you know, evenly split there. I thought that was interesting. 
All right, so these are this is what is important to you. How do you think we're doing there? Please rate these services. So in this case, green is excellence and the purple is no opinion. And you can see uh, books and materials, good or excellence, um, very high marks from folks. Um, the the most no opinion, I don't really use them. I don't have a lot of thoughts about them, were Bookmobile and Outreach Services and Public Use Computers. And then the thing that was kind of the most balanced, pretty split, was the, um, what does my note say here? Uh, digital Materials, so the library websites, basically good, excellent, and then a, a bit of fair and more poor than we've had on some other responses here. I had a question about that. So do you think, because I read not all 93 pages, but I just gave them probably... Yeah, some of the feedback. <laughs> I got a good point. You know. But there was some of the website specifically, it seemed to me they could have been applying to the old version of the website, and some of them could have been applying to the new version. And do you have a feel for that? Um, from the respondents? Yeah, well, like this yeah. library, the poor on what library website, are they talking about the old one or the new one specifically? Do we have yeah. a Yeah. Um, well, if you get through some of that feedback, some of it is very targeted towards the website's uh, changes that happened over the yeah. summer. Some of them are very targeted to say, right. so that's I like the old way to do it. Yes. You know, um, and, and some of them, I got the sense, uh, had not engaged with the newer website and it was prior to that, but I don't yeah. have a good breakdown for for who was using which one there. Yeah, that that was, matches my sort yeah. of impression. I kind of think that this reflects a little bit the transitional period between the two resources. So people were used to one, they're using another one. They're not sure about things that they used to be able to do. Uh, you know, as we talked about last summer, really, and then quite a bit before that, the, the one of the unintended consequences of turning on the, the new jmrl.org was that we pointed everybody towards Find It as well, which is a new catalog that had been available for a long time. It is fundamentally different from the old catalog, and some of the responses we got reflect that. People didn't like the differences, or they, they didn't like that things that they used to be able to do in one way now required another, yeah. another way to do it. I was just struck by the ones, I would say maybe two-thirds, one-third, which was one-third was talking about something that was like, well, that's from the old website. So yeah. they, they kind of hadn't, that was just my thought. Uh, yeah, so I wish I wish I had better data and yeah. maybe asked a, a question specifically about that. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, and then just some some responses on I would like to see JMRL services focus on. And again, people could make more than one choice here. So the top things there were community information involvement, children's and youth services, being a community meeting center, current topics, popular titles, and basic literacy. And then, you know, a lot of things grouped in together there. Okay, library events. Um, so which best represents your views on library events? The red is good. Uh, the blue is, is a no response to the questions where the library offers events that meet my needs. It was largely yes. Um, but 200 or so, no there. That was the, the most negative responses in these four. It's easy to register for, largely yes. I've been able to secure a spot. I can get in, largely yes. And the events I've attended were well organized and presented. So um, largely a very positive response to the events that libraries that JMRL puts on. How did you learn about them? So uh, kind of piggybacking on what Mike was just talking about, library website was far and away the, the top place where people learned about JMRL events. Uh, after that, being in the library or on the library social media, and then from friends and family, the email newsletter on down. A couple comments that we, we thought were interesting here, um, kind of, thanks for letting your space be available for non-library events. You know, this person is mostly using, uh, accessing the library to attend non-library events. I don't go to events, but it sounds great. None of them interested me. I didn't know there were events. And then some people looking at kind of online news sources, which I guess didn't quite fall into uh, television, radio, or non-library social media. And then some directly from staff or from other events in the community. But my big takeaway here was that the website was the driving promotional force for these 1,200 respondents. Okay, library spaces. Please select the JMRL location you use the most. So here we limited people to just one response. So here's the one that you're going to the most. And, and again, not surprisingly, it's Northside is the, the most then central, 
then Crozet, then Gordon, and then each uh, branch after that. So these are these are where most people filled out their surveys or where their home library is. First question is about spaces, the first series of questions. So are you satisfied with the location of the library? Uh, predominantly, yes. Everybody's pretty happy with where the library is that they identified as the library they use the most. Open hours, slightly more no responses there. So roughly, you know, 20 to 30 percent um, not satisfied with the hours there. Physical spaces, largely satisfied. A few people not satisfied. Okay. Um, so here was by branch. So those the same questions broken down by branch. So satisfied with the library's location. Uh, the, the blue is yes. The orange is no. So largely yes. Again, Northside had the biggest no, but again, that's proportional. They had the, the most responses, period. Open hours. Uh, the uh, most responses, yes, were north side, but then the most responses, no, were also north side. I think this breaks out of the proportional a little bit to more people trying to let it be known that they're not happy with hours or they would like to see different hours. Some also for a crozet as well, that seems to be a higher proportion of no responses than than in just like this is the library I, I use. Kind of guessing that was Sunday. Yeah, I would think that that's tied into requests for more. Well, not always Sunday. Some of it's morning hours, some evening hours, but a lot of Sunday. I've heard, I've heard from several people that have been consistent. Because they don't have to remember what day of the week it is. They want the library to be open from 9 to 5 every day so they don't have to remember what 9 to 9 every day. <laughs> Most of the people I talk to are. <laughs> uh, physical spaces. So, uh, you know, largely, yes, I'm satisfied, uh, but you can see the kind of what's out of portion here is the central library. That's the most no responses for people that are dissatisfied with the physical space. So it'd be nice to see these as actual percentages uh, so we could rank that down and that could feed into the, it would be a data point for renovation. Yeah, uh, we can find that's okay, this, that. Yeah. This one is 20% and the, the next or eighty percent satisfied in the, in the next uh, yeah, that's we've got all that data, so it's easy to pull out. Okay, library technology. Um, the top is technologies people would like to see improved, and the bottom are new technologies people would like to learn about. Uh, number one option for what they would like to see improved or access to library resources from home. So this is not that specific of a question. You know, in hindsight, looking back at it, uh, are people talking about digital materials that they can check out and read? Are they talking about research capacities? Uh, you know, are they talking about information about the library? We didn't do a great job here of trying to tease that out. Um, but the, the next question does um, online research tools specifically. So people say they would like to see improvement there. New technologies is next. More wireless internet access for personal devices. More catalog computers. Which is very interesting. That trend has been away from catalog computers because people have you know, data in their hands. And then things that people would like to learn about, craft material art creation and 3D printing, uh, digitalization of obsolete formats. So all three of those things are initiatives that JMRL is working on and has some capacity for. So those, that's good to hear that people are interested in that. We're already working on that. Uh, artificial intelligence, they'd like to learn about. So this tells us we need to do some work in maybe programming or making making a space. <laughs> right. What is digitalization of obsolete formats? Um, I, when I hear that, I'm thinking about turning VHS tapes into digital formats or digitizing uh, scrapbooks or pictures or anything like we have a machine that did slides too. So you can take materials that you have. It's kind of archival is not the word, but your your family might have and you can turn them into a format that's useful. We did that as part of the last strategic plan, I think, or some project we had um, some video of, of uh, interviews that the library did. At one point, with community stakeholders, so we used that material to digitize it, and now it's there for posterity. Okay, customer service. Uh, to what extent do you agree? So strongly agree. Very high marks for the library staff are friendly and helpful. Um, also, high marks for the library staff are experienced and well trained. I was happy to see that. Overall level of service, so 82% excellent, 15% good, so 97% 
good or excellent there. That's good. The folks that filled this out are largely overall satisfied um, by library service. <coughs> and then asking them about the last time they used a library, select all items which describe the service they received. So 86% uh, of the folks said that staff were welcoming, pleasant, knowledgeable, and helpful, I think, communicate clearly, and then some room for improvement in the next few, and then um, not a small subset said I didn't ask for help, just use the, the facilities or materials. Library collections. <clears throat> All right. How do you rate the following things? So it's fiction, nonfiction, large print, children's, young adult books, magazines, newspapers, DVDs, audiobooks, overall satisfaction with the library collection. So, um, Orange is good, green is excellent, purple is no opinion. So you can see that fiction books, good or excellent. Nonfiction books, a little bit more, no opinion. This tells me most of our readers here are fiction readers, that that's what they were accessing, that's what they liked. Uh, not reading a lot of large print, a lot of, lot of uh, no opinion there, a lot of no opinion in newspapers, magazines. Children's and young adults, a little bit more balanced there. Um, overall satisfaction with the collection, though, very hard marks for good or excellent. Okay, specifically digital library collection. So that was physical materials there. Uh, orange is good, red is fair, green is no opinion. So this tells me, this. these responses here tell me that our 1,200 responders are largely um, not big users with the streaming service or digital Material, so uh, no opinion is the highest mark on digital magazines or streaming media. There's a fair amount of use in the downloadable ebooks, online databases, downloadable audiobooks. There's still a fair, there's a large, you know, no opinion there, but people do have opinions either fair or excellent for those. So there's some use of those, very little use of the next two, and pretty mixed results on overall satisfaction with the digital library collection. That also comes up frequently in that preform feedback where it's people, um, a lot of it has to do with getting access, so um, waiting too long to access digital materials, books and audiobooks specifically. Uh, some of it has to do with the, uh, with the providers there. I remember some comments about not liking the switch from OverDrive to Libby. Um, well, those are the, it's the same company that, that used to offer an app called OverDrive, now it's called Libby, so we have very little control over that. Um, so it's just kind of a change in Okay, and then the freeform feedback. Uh, here are the, the large themes that I identified, but there I'm sure are more because there was a lot of feedback there. And the, um, the subcommittee uh, did a couple different things to try and tease that out. We teased out the comments that were about facilities specifically, about central. I shared that with the central working group. There was a couple pages of people saying, you know, this, this library needs to be renovated. Here's this. And Krista pulled out the stuff about hours too. So we've got a separate document with that information. So overall, lots of positive feedback where people just left a note saying, thank you, library, thank you, library staff, thank you, library board, appreciate your work. Uh, and then a lot of physical space improvements. A lot of those uh, requests are centraled around the central library, about the need to update the library there, about the need to either do an overall renovation or have some sort of refresh of the, the thing, um, the, the space there. A lot of requests for parking improvements, which is pretty much uh, almost every branch at JMRL. There are some sort of complaints about parking access there. The the best are probably Louisa and Nelson, um, but we still hear we still have issues with parking there as well. A lot of requests for expanded hours system wide. So as I said, it does go all over the place. There were some very specific requests for Sunday access at Northside. At Crozet, uh, there was a request for Central to have Sunday access year-round, and there are requests for uh, other locations for very specific to that location. I'm sure, there likely were some. Tony, to your point about consistency and you know wanting to have same hours. A lot of feedback on ebook access. So those issues that I mentioned, uh, you know, long wait times, not having materials available there uh, when they're initially looking for them, and then the actual um, the different apps that are used to interface with those things. Fair amount of feedback asking JMRL to present a balanced collection of services. So some of this was tied into people responding to uh, the name page discussion. I'm 
the name of the library discussion that the library went through. Uh, and so people directly responding to that saying, hey, keep your keep your focus on, on library services, keep them fair and balanced. Um, and then website catalog update, as we were discussing earlier, a fair amount of feedback on changes that have happened to the website and the catalog. Either positive or negative, but a lot of it people saying, I, you know, I wanted this thing and I don't have it anymore. I don't know how to do this thing that I used to be able to do. So that is the 20 minute summary of what we got there. Um, you all have access to the raw data. We'll work on presenting this to the public, getting something together to say thank you all for taking the time. Uh, we did do a drawing for each location. Um, and I can announce the drawing winners for the five-year plan survey. So each branch had somebody uh, win a gift card. Linda Goodwin for the Bookmobile, Ann Crescent for the Central Library, Patrice Ream for Close, Teresa Cox for Gordon Avenue, Andrea Lafew for Green County, Aaron No Last Name for Louisa County, Jerry Simonelli for Nelson Memorial, Susan Kirby for Northside, and Stu Rollins for Scottsdale. So the library really appreciates everyone who took the time to fill out so give us their feedback. Questions? Got a couple here. Um, first one is uh, right, some folks said that they wanted to learn about artificial intelligence. And I'm curious um, if, if anyone at the library is developing that competency, um, you know, even if it's as simple as spending time playing with like chat GPT and those kinds of things. And um, and if so, it'd be really interesting. I mean, you got to watch out for the privacy issues, but it'd be very interesting to have an AI summarization of the free form feedback because that would provide an unbiased sort of summary of like what if, what's in here without spending thousands yeah. of hours. Um, so it just feels like, to me, it feels like that would actually be a good competency to have within the library and to have someone who's able to then. Yeah, teach the public. And we did do that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the uh, cool. the five year plan committee did that. They okay. fed they fed the ninety three pages of information uh -huh. into uh, ChatGPT uh -huh. to get summaries based on some general areas, and this is kind of a <laughs> summation of that. Okay. Basically, okay. Um, we ran into figuring out what the limits are for how much ChatGPT will actually summarize yeah. for you. Yeah. Uh, it is. It, it would only do chunks at a time, right. basically, but then you could tell it, okay, remember that, and then compare that to this. Uh, we have staff that have been undergoing some training, like uh, artificial intelligence in the library. They've gone to some workshops and things like that. Um, we have not developed uh, any programming around it per se, but I know there's been some discussion about just having kind of in the library's role of introducing people to emerging technologies, just having like a, somebody talk for 20 minutes and then show off like here's a little, you know, this would be a good example to show like, hey, we got all these responses and here's how you can use this to help summarize. That's awesome. like that. cool. So I can share that out if people are interested in seeing the yeah, no, like chat GPT we're said. doing, but I don't think guys already done it. That's great. And And so the other one, it's also, kind of spurred by the free form feedback um, piece. It's like, with these kinds of surveys, I always wonder like, what what are the blind spots? And the one that comes to mind for me, and it was mentioned in a few uh, uh, folks' feedback were, were library fines, right? Mm -hmm. Fines for overdue or missing yes. books. And, you know, and my understanding is, right, the, the it's hard to get people who aren't library users to fill out the survey, right? So that, right, so folks who aren't using the, the library are, Underrepresented in the results, and um, and and the thing about fees that kind of bother me is, in many cases, it's the folks without money can't afford, so they can't afford to buy books, and they're afraid to use the library because they can get fined. Um, and uh, you know, I I sort of wonder, and I know that, and also it's a bit of a blind, it, it, can, it can be a bit of a blind spot because it's it's kind of like, do we really want the answer? Like what right, what percentage of the population out there is not using the library because of mm -hmm. you know of, of fees? And um, so I'm just curious, like with something like that, how does that how or when does that issue get talked about? Um, uh, it was in the 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 current five year plan that we're under, so we're we're in a year long collect data to provide to the board that says what the impact of a fine-free library would be. So it's been talked about at that level, at the strategic planning level, 
the board has discussed it, you know, a little bit, basically. Um, we are in kind of a unique scenario compared to other public library systems where uh, single jurisdiction library systems, fines and fees generally come in as a revenue to the, the county or city or whatnot. The way that JMRL is structured, we rely upon those funds for our equipment. Basically. So when it's time to pass an equipment budget next year, that is entirely dependent upon this resource. So you're right. There was feedback saying we should get rid of these things. The library needs to think about it and talk about it. But we can't <laughs> just wave it away. Like, I'm not saying oh, other know, libraries can just wave yeah, it away. There needs to be a replacement right. for those resources. Right. So I think that that gets discussed at a board level, basically, yeah. figuring yeah. out, okay, getting some data on how much money are we talking about annually and how are we going to do the things that we need to do to provide library services right. without that money. And then there needs to be a discussion, well, probably before that, the board needs to have a discussion about where they ideologically fit. <laughs> I need mean, to uh, have a hard time about fines and fees. Um, you know, whether or not the board is committed yeah. to yeah. we should get rid of okay. this thing. So just one idea that, um, and then I'll shut up on this. Um, so my wife works at Meals on Wheels, and I know that some of her clients are in that situation where they're not using the library because of fines and fees, mm -hmm. right? And and, and um, it, it, it occurs to me that organizations like Meals on Wheels that is serving that kind of population would be a good partner for surveying that sort of question, right? Because they have a mix of people who are using the library through the bookmobile and people who, who aren't. Um, and... Uh, so that that may be a way to get some insight with other That's partners great. with assisted living facilities to get a mix of people who are and aren't using the library. And we, we had a, a sort of subset of this uh, with Julian fees, fines and fees. How long ago was it? Yeah, we got rid of juvenile fines and fees prior to me stepping in as director. Uh, so that was over five years ago. I think that the discussions that staff have had about this have had to do Okay, if we can't, you know, if there's not going to be, uh, let's step entirely away from fines and fees without some sort of replacement there, then it would be, let's look at senior uh, fines and fees, you know, whether we already did that for kids, you know, mm -hmm. could we, to those Meals on Wheels patrons, or let's look at um, automatic renewals that gets talked about as well. So as long as somebody's not on hold for an item that you could then renew it automatically without it accruing fees. Right. So there, there's been... A lot of staff discussion about this, certainly, and this comes up. It came up, in fact, in the internal surveys that we did as well, because we have staff who hear from the American Library Association and from our neighbors and peers that fines are not a good idea and that they are a barrier to access. So I think there'd be a lot of support internally from staff. We just, the board would need to figure out how to. I, I think that, you know, I think it's a good thing to address. I think we should make that an agenda item at some point. Let's look at that again. Obviously, you can't just put on the agenda. We have to have a, you know, a full rundown of what it costs us, you know, going back over X years and so forth and so on. But I think maybe in 2024, we should maybe take, take a look at it again. We should have the end of that goal. If you remember um, last year, the, the board added a year to a goal uh, in the previous, in the, well, the current five year plan about that data collection because we needed to change some internal, like how we were accounting for things to make sure we knew exactly. What's a fine versus what's a lost or damaged materials? We also had an issue with the pandemic numbers. I think yeah, we so were thrown I mean, off yeah. by that. Yeah. Obviously, well, no one we, was checking anything else. Also, there we, was we didn't no charge fees, fees for a, a good period of time <laughs> yeah. during the pandemic as yeah. well. Like there were no late fees for at least the first year between May of 2020 and I think July of 21. I'd have to look back and see exactly. So, um, but it is a, also an interesting question because I think. Um, we could get rid of fees tomorrow, but that still won't cause any of those people to use the library because they're somehow had a fee when they were, you know, 12 and they're sort of traumatized by that. And I, you could tell them a million times there's no fees, but they may still have some of the, there would be, have to be a sort of, sort of education right. campaign with, with that. Mm -hmm. That might not be the only reason that they're not using it, but using they the library. having trouble getting out of the house. Right. Um, to location. What happened with when we had the day that you could bring the books back uh, with no fine, did they have a large influx? Not a, not a overwhelming, but we have had a few amnesty days in the yeah. past where you can return materials. Um, 
and we've done like the book drive, the um, food drive this year. You know, you could get mm -hmm. money off your mind. That's a stopgap yeah, mm -hmm. measure. Uh, I think to, to Meredith's point, when the library got rid of juvenile fines, it took a while to see that. You know, you've got kids that checked out a book in second grade that then came back to the library in middle school and were told you can't use the library because you never returned that book then. Right. And they likely maybe never will come back. So mm -hmm. it takes it takes them. Yeah, I mean there's there's that's that's sort of a two part question. Going forward, do we get rid of it and is there an amnesty for us? For the juvenile fines there was right. all overdue fines. So we're not talking about loss and damaged materials. Right. We still require payment for the last child uh, if a book gets scrapped for it. Dog chewed on it. Another thing, Mr. Data, I'd like to think about is baseline for the survey and previous surveys that we've done for the you know the five year plan, and what kinds of questions did we ask in those surveys and the responses that we got. Um, I'm sure that information is archived somewhere. Yeah, we have. Um, you know, some point, you send me a, a link to the stuff so I can okay. wander through that and compare it to what's going on here. Yeah, the um, the the length to which that happened during this process was that the community engagement subcommittee looked at all the previous right. questions to see you know what had been used in the past, but there was no comparison of five years ago answers versus ten years ago answers. I suspect that's not of interest to everybody. <laughs> yes, here you go. Presentation was that long. I think this is this is I mean it's great data. It's obviously very good grounds for discussion to sustain the next purpose of a five year plan is to be able to see what we should be doing here going forward. So any other questions or comments? I guess I'll ask one sum up. So if you uh, David, I know you've spent personally a, I think you probably have read all ninety three pages <laughs> and thought about it a lot. Uh, and I'll put you on the spot with this a little bit. If, if you could, um, and, and overall, it seems to be a highly successful, you know, high level of satisfaction, which is great. But in terms of always trying to improve, if you could, uh, off the top of your head, what are the top three maybe takeaways in terms of opportunities to do even better or, you know, emphasis areas that kind of came, came up, up to, you know, as you see it from, from what you've done? Renovate the central library. <laughs> uh, no, I, that, I say that snarkily, but it's true. You know, uh, make sure that all of our spaces are, are welcoming and inviting and modern and, and you know ready to be used in the, the current sense of the library. Uh, that would be a top thing, and that doesn't. That's not just a central thing. It's all of our branches, and so only you know <clears throat> Nelson is really the only one that's only two years old right. at this point. Um, I think a lot of the general themes from all of those, all of that feedback had to do with um, convenience is not exactly the right word, but it's access. It's an access issue where people's expectations for accessing materials and information now is different than it was because we're all used to being able to, to tap something and then something shows up at your door, you know, two days later or whatnot. So uh, the library has to be able to offer that level of service. So whether that's in materials, whether it's in what our website looks like and feels like, whether that's in you know um, our programming and getting access to it, that's kind of the overarching theme that I got. And it's not that people were saying we're not doing a good job of that per se. It's just that the, the overall expectation. Yeah, it's changed. Yeah, it's yeah, changed it's over changed. time. Yeah, yeah. Like when and when things don't go that way, then then you 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 hear about it more. Like when we offer a service and then it doesn't meet somebody's standard, we would hear about it. Like when Brandy went to go use the locker at, at Louisa and because there is critters inside of it, it wasn't working. You know, we set the expectation and told you, here's you can go use this great new service and it doesn't meet that standard, then we would hear about it. So kind of that in general across all of our offerings. Big enough, big enough for you. Yeah, those are great comments. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, the ebook issue is hard for it is people very hard. because people just assume it's like, you know, the Spotify or Pandora that you can yeah. listen to any book anytime you want to. And it, I mean, I know that in my age group, women in my age group get really frustrated that they have to wait 
literally weeks you know, listen and they're all listening to books now because yes um, that they can't get access to those online. Yeah. And you, you hit the nail right on the head. And, um, you know, we could, that could be an unending money pit to try to meet that demand. We will never be able to beat yeah. that demand where at any given point, you know, whatever the hot new book is now, everybody who wants it can press a button and get it because of the way the licensing works yeah. and the way we have to pay for it. Yeah. We'll never be able to do that. So we will shift towards putting more resources towards buying more copies, but it's not going to, solve that problem because you can't it's not simultaneous use you get this one copy and if mike wants a copy we have to buy another copy for him. i'm not sure everybody understands that i mean there could be more effort at educating your future about why why they don't so they could so it could be a, it could end up being negotiated you could renegotiate it the library out there that's super frustrated. And it's happened so fast. I mean, it's just amazing the people I know how quickly they've converted to yes. all the podcasts, all the mm -hmm. pandemic. Mm -hmm. It takes so long. I read it faster than when it's a listen, and you listen it like 16 hours and maybe. Uh, I know. <laughs> you don't do the double time. You can do the double time once. Oh yeah, I, I tried that once. Brain explosion. <laughs> that up. Um, I will say there's no report from the five year command uh, five year plan committee today, but uh, just to give everybody an update, uh, what has happened now is uh, Meredith has convened a small working group uh, that is doing actual drafting here, and if you recall, the goal was to have. A one page summary. Here's our, here's our overarching vision for the next five years in these areas with some details on the back about what that means. And then a corresponding staff document that says, okay, here's who needs to do what in order to make those things happen. So we're working on wordsmithing. We've met a couple times in the last few weeks. Potentially we'll have a meeting before the next. Thank you. Thank you. From new business, we transition to old business. Uh, we have a second reading and a potential vote on C5.6, which is signing capacity. Look at this, look at this uh, in our November meeting. Yes, and we've been passed all the slides. <laughs> the very last page. Um, okay. uh, so um, we did read this last month. Uh, you've got this in two. Pages. So the first page with the border and the black black text is the current version, and the the, the reverse. If you're looking at the physical handout here, is the the red text is essentially a full scale replacement of is what what's proposed is the red text as a full scale replacement for the current version. Um, and the idea was to make it. Uh, a little more high level, um, just defining purposes and goals, and then some of the some of the things in the current version about you're going to view it every two years specifically. That's more of a procedural decision, whereas the high level uh, uh, policy goal might just be make sure that things are up to date and, and are current, uh, and then leave it to the staff to figure out exactly how to meet that kind of general standard. So I don't think I'll read through it again, but if there's other questions or, or comments, uh, it's up for you know potential vote today. I think books should be capitalized in Virginia festivals. Of <laughs> yes. Ah, not a lot, Doc. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. We'll make that, if the board votes on it today, we'll make that change. Okay. Other questions, comments? I wonder whether or not we should move the last line of that paragraph, members of the public interested in posting information at JMRL should refer to policy, you know, that whole sentence, to the bottom. Um, that's, that's and the old and that's so. He's got it highlighted there. Yeah. Okay. Right. Sorry. Back to sleep. <laughs> So Martha, you're suggesting that take this line, members of the public interested in posting information at JMRL should refer to policy 4.51. Yeah. 
and just place it at the end? At the end. And my thinking is, if on policy we are going to direct members of the public to something, you know, a direction, a how-to uh, that has to do with um, we, what we were just talking about, the uh, uh, doing a uh, program for somebody or something like that, if we have it regularly that your next step is at the bottom of the page or how to do it or your next contact's at the bottom of the page, then there is a, sort of a systematic place that a person can look for that next step. I mean, it does make sense that it goes right after talking about who can post a sign because, mm -hmm. I mean, you could theoretically, I don't know if there's any reason for that paragraph, though, to be where it is. It's just another thought in the process. So it, it could theoretically read the entire thing, I suppose. It seems to flow very well, but I think you're correct that people are looking. How often do you think members of the public are reading? Uh, this is not one of the policies that we were talking earlier in the policy committee, like the policies that generally we hand out to patrons. Those are pretty specific. They usually have to do with conduct or things like that. Um, so I don't know how often people are, are seeing this. I, I think the point with that one sentence that Martha identified was to tell people this is not that policy. You know, so this the rest of this policy has has not a ton of impact on public users of the library. It's more about the library as an organization and what 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 our signs are are meant to say and how we how we're going to use them. What I've noticed, having been working with the public, and that the times that they read these things most is when they have a problem. Yeah. You know, you can send a parent letter home to the mom and dad. And if it's something that you know that people have had problems with the neighbors, let me go back and see. And that's when it becomes very, very important. Not that people don't read it, but I think that's people I, I I like Martha, the general idea of what you're saying is that our, all of our policies should have, you know, if there's some other referential point for, for the public that they should all be in the same place so they all know where to look for them. I just this would be the first of those that was designed that way. None of the rest, <laughs> I think, follow that procedure. Which is just okay. A, yeah, it's just a suggestion. Well, it seems to me that that, that, that whole paragraph could be moved to the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Because you talk about the, uh, what the signs represent, and then under, then if you skip that, what the signs represent, and then the signs should be visually appealing, and then then it, that then uh, can be placed in designated areas. But then it says, gen then you would say generally the, uh, uh, only the staff can can post them. So, and then you know, to me that would would follow. So the proposal is to move that whole paragraph. Generally, signs may only be posted to make it the final paragraph in the new policy. Does anyone? Yes, yes that sounds good. good. That sounds good to me. Sounds okay. Yeah. Sounds okay. Capitalized book. And capitalized book. <laughs> say something like. We did that out last month. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait, yeah. Did you point that out last month? That's embarrassing. <laughs> the motion would have to say, you know, yeah, as amended or something like that, you know, as as amended by the board. I need a light. <laughs> All right. Can I have a motion to accept? The policy, science policy, as recently amended. I move that the policy be accepted as recently amended. 
Aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Now we get to favorite topic, which is the fiscal year 25 budget update. Um, so I think the biggest update is the information that I sent to you all last week, uh, which hopefully everybody saw, uh, which was that there was a last minute increase in healthcare costs for uh, JMRL for next fiscal year. So we were running off of a 3.6% increase, which was the ceiling that, that the city council thought that they were going to have to pay on, on um, medical next year, but uh, they got their actuals in for next year, and they're going to be even higher than that. So it was an overall for JMRL 7.9% increase. Uh, so we had to rework the budget last week with that information in it. I, uh, the, the revision is up on the website already under the proposed budget there. I sent that information to all five of our jurisdictional partners. The only one that we had already met with was Louisa County. So I sent that to Wanda and Christian and let them know and yeah, explain the difference. Them. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's not the end of the world because it's better now than than you know next August or something. But uh, it's a little unfortunate about the timing of it. This seems to be happening with some frequency now that the actual numbers that are coming in for uh, medical are coming in a little later than our schedule, which is November, the Thanksgiving meeting. Basically, the board uh, votes on a budget. So one of the things that we can discuss with our jurisdictional partners is potentially moving the vote to December. For our budget, they like the information as early as they can get it because this is while they're starting their own work. But if it means we're going to have to do this every year, then it's probably better to wait. So I'll, especially Charlottesville and Albemarle, the numbers are coming from Charlottesville. Albemarle pays the largest percentage there. And so this, this impact is much more impactful for them in the tens of thousands of dollars than it is for our other jurisdictions. So that's a discussion we'll have in the weeks to come. Uh, Martha and I are meeting with the Green County Administrator uh, this week on Wednesday. Uh, meetings with Albemarle, Charlottesville, and Nelson are scheduled for early in January. And then I just wanted to give you all the adoption dates as they're currently scheduled for each locality. So each of them votes on their own budget cycle. Uh, the first, Albemarle, will present the administrator's proposed budget on February 21st and then vote on it on May 1st. So that means at the end of February or mid, mid to late February, we'll know what the staff in the county are recommending to the board and it will have a number for the library. We'll know if it's close to what the, um, the library is asking for, then May 1st they'll vote. In Charlottesville, the budget presentation will be on March 5th and their final vote on a budget is supposed to be April 9th. All of these are, are subject to change. In Louisa, the budget will be presented on March 18th and the board will have a final vote on April 15th. Um, Green historically has presented their budget in March and adopted in May. They don't have their calendars not posted yet, but we'll find out this Wednesday. Nelson historically begins their work sessions in March and they adopt in June. So they wait until the uh, final month. So just FYI for you all, those, those of you that are coming with me to meet with jurisdictions, you've already got a date and time and should have the information that you need. But that's kind of the time frame that they're working on. So in those windows, they will have budget work sessions if needed. Either myself or some combination of you all will go and speak on behalf of the library again in a public setting. That's where we are on budgets today. Any questions on the ever going ongoing process? And thank you, David, for jumping in and getting that out. <clears throat> yeah, thank, thanks to Jerry Carcini, too, for turning that around really quickly last week. Which brings us to the library director's report. Okay, um, I wanted to thank Alita for accompanying me to the annual uh, Charlottesville Albemarle NAACP Freedom Fund Banquet, where we uh, presented, JMRL presented our scholarship internship winter winner for 2023, Nandi Ho. Nandi was unable to attend, but her mother, Lori Struthers, came with us. And um, thank also to the friends for funding this scholarship and for sponsoring our attendance at the banquet. So it was a lovely event that has been on hold for the past three years. This was the first year it was back post-COVID, so it was nice. It was at the center at Belvedere, which I had not been to. It's the, the former senior center, and it's a beautiful building. It's not that far from here. It's very impressive. Um, Kayla Payne, Meredith Dickens, and Jennifer McAdam Miller on staff are working on a year-end wrap-up for social media, so if you follow JMRL on social media, you'll see this. I saw it today. It, oh, yeah. it, 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 
it's, it's a bunch of it's neat graphics that have some numbers on them. Yeah. Um, well, it's really good. I'm going to do the boring version of that, or I'm just going to read you a bunch of numbers. Uh, so this is kind of a snapshot of the year. A lot of organizations are doing this kind of like your Spotify will tell you, here's your most, here's your rap for the year. Uh, so this is data through November. But um, top checkouts, the top physical fiction book, so a book got checked out from the library, is Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. Top uh, Physical nonfiction was I'm Glad My Mom Died by Jeanette McCurdy. <laughs> <laughs> Top audiobooks for adults to check out was Sparring Partners by John Grisham. Top DVD for adults was Everything Everywhere All at Once. Top Canopy, that's streaming checkout for adults, is Father Brown, the series, the, the mystery series. The top ebook in Libby was Demon Copperhead uh, by Barbara Kingsolver. The top e audiobook in Libby was Fourth Wing. By Rebecca Yaros, thank you. <laughs> the top magazine checked out in Libby was The New Yorker. The top young adult checkout uh, was The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. The top juvenile chapter book checkout was Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Roderick Wools. <laughs> the top picture book checkout was I Will Take a Nap by Mo Willems. And you have to go down to number 22 on the list to find a non Mo Willems title. Oh, so the first 21. First 21 uh, titles are Mo Willems. <laughs> top kids DVD was Sing. And the top canopy checkout for kids was Creepy Carrots. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, some, some uh, JMRL specific stats. Uh, 12,000 new cards were made um, this fiscal year, which is up 2,000 from, la not this fiscal year, sorry, this calendar year through November. That's up 2,000 from 2022 for that same period. 1.6 five uh, million items checked out in 2023, which is about what we did in last fiscal year. Computer, so in-house and Wi-Fi usage combined was 76,000. So that's either using a, a library computer or using the Wi-Fi there. That's up 12,000 uh, usages from the year before. 76,000 people of all ages attended 2,600 programs. That's about 800 more programs than the year before, about 30,000 more people attending. So post-COVID numbers, 712,000 visitors overall, which is up 50,000 for the same period last year. So all in all, every metric that we could look at, more use, uh, numbers up. That's good. And finally, I'm happy to announce that that Gordon Avenue book drop, long discussed, is open to the public. Uh, it has been open since December 4th. We've got a lot of great press for that, and I'll report back on usage once it's been up and running for a while, and we've got some numbers to share there. I think I mentioned it's a slightly different service than Northside's because you don't have to place something on hold specifically to pick up at the window. You can place it on hold to pick up at Gordon and then make a choice when you get there. So it's really for when you get there and the parking lot is full, you can come through and pick up your items, whether or not you place it for the window. There, there was a comment in the survey that I loved that said, I love, I love the drive the drive-through because I can bring my dog. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Camille was here earlier telling us that they have dog treats at the Lincoln's. <laughs> yeah. But the budget will be limited. On yes, the dog treats <laughs> budget is thanks to the friends of the library and not the pet. <laughs> That's all I have to report today, Tony. Other matters. Big was category. There seems to have anything yet. Okay. Um, future agenda items. Again, yeah, we'll be back meeting the fourth week, fourth Monday. And that'll be here. And we'll be here. Yeah, that'll, that'll be, I believe, the last one here before we start a, a series of four visits to other branches. Okay. Real quick. Um, so, agenda items for that? There'll be a budget report. There'll be a central library working group. Um, potentially a five-year plan report, even if the whole committee doesn't meet there, then I should have something to share. We've all realized that this makes David and I fill with other things that you may or may not be. <laughs> well, we should have time and space for our continuing ed, so I'll yes. look back through the list of what we haven't gotten to. Yeah, if anyone has any um, library services, programs, things that they would like to hear about, during continuing ed, please let David know. Yeah. Get some of that. about that. Something you've always wanted to know about the library. Yeah, you go. to ask. I'm so afraid. What are creepy carrots? <laughs>
And failing that, <clears throat> always happy to say a motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'd like to say thank you all for the hard work this past year. It's been great. I really appreciate everything you've done for the library, and I'm sure the library appreciates it. Happy holidays. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's what I tell my kids. Bye.